and welcome to what is the first part of the second batch of these videos. And by now, you might well have learnt that there are some lives coming. They're going to be cool. Although there's going to be a slight change in the dating of them, which I will explain as we go on. And that one of them is going to have its date move, because there's going to be an armchair admirals on the day it was originally scheduled for. So, what is this series about? Well, this series starts from Wayne Boring's suggestion. Do you know an evaluation of each combat in Navy in World War II, and give us your list of top five, the top five weaknesses in order, why those weaknesses existent, and how those weaknesses could have been addressed, if at all, on dates of January the 1st, 1939, January 1st, 1940, 1941, 1942, and 1943. We don't do. So, I have done 1939 and 1940. Uh, 40. Uh, this is the beginning of the 1941 and 42 series. Now, I've included some smaller powers, not all, because honestly, there are some there is nothing you can do to fix. They're not in a strategic situation where you can fix them. And I've included some minor powers because I just like to talk about them. I've also adjusted it to an extent that sometimes it's not five. But one of the issues which has come up, which has been discussed in the response comments to the first batch, 39 or 41 was this but this requires more money this requires you spend more money that's not one request here now if it had been you have to use the same budget i would have done probably things like well instead of upgrading royal oak i'd have upgraded repulse through personal choice there was a debate at the time whether or not to upgrade repulse instead of royal oak that is something which was there the Admiralty, including the Third Sea Lord, come down on the idea of we upgrade Royal Oak to see if it's viable to upgrade the Isles, because frankly, there are more of them, and if we can upgrade them in any way, shape, or form, that buys us time and makes them more useful, uh, more useful force. They find out that it's not the case, but I would have preferred to spend that money upgrading the Ren uh, Repulse, personally. It gets a lot more difficult once you're saying you cannot increase the budget at all. Although I do think many of my suggestions, i.e. sloops, etc. And the construction of them have been ultimately not that expensive. In fact, they would have been cheaper longer term to have built or ordered when they were, could have been. And would have had a cumulative impact on the war effort. Because having more such small escorts in service prior to war beginning would have made you a better position to deal with the early submarine threat, which would have probably taken out a lot of the pre-war, a lot more pre-war crews of the German submarine arm, which would have then had a consequential knock-on in of impact on their quality training and the operability of their submarines as the war went on, which could have in turn made things a lot easier in other ways. So, yeah. Although you're not supposed to be using foreknowledge. Hey ho! The French Navy. I've got them still in this one. They're not in the 1942. That just seems a bit cruel to put them in. But the French are still a factor. They're not a participant by this point. But they're still a factor. They're something the Royal Navy still has to think about, something the Royal Navy still has to worry about, something the Royal Navy still has to factor into their operations. Now, the debate here is, what could the French have done? Well, the question is, do you want to fight Germany? Especially now, you've got the sort of the Merzel kabir experience, where the British basically took your surrendering and went, well, if you're going to surrender, we're not going to trust you, so we're attack we'll blow you up. Or do you want to fight the Allies? Which would be seem rather dishonourable. And counterintuitive and against your interests, because you don't see... You, broad as a whole, France does not agree with the Axis powers. Either way, they are actually working on strengthening the Navy. Interesting enough, they are fitting radar, they are upgrading the armament of their ships, 
they are paying close attention to what is going on in the world and to the information coming from the operations going on around them. Which means they're, to an extent, quite an interesting case study because they are a participant termed observer, very interested observer, and they are looking at what's happening and they are upgrading their ships to fit what is happening. So, yeah. If I was them, I would be doing exactly what they were doing, trying to increase AA fitness, uh, AA fittings, anti-aircraft, as uh, AA, uh, trying to increase their radar capability. I would be moving ships away from France. I'm um, sorry. I would be. I, I can understand why they're not, and then I can understand why they maybe have trouble trusting them going that far, but I would be moving ships as fast as I could to Algeria and rotating them out of French ports. I would be keeping them away from the Germans, because they are still my bargaining blocks with the Germans, and they're my bargaining blocks with the Allies. And wherever I can best position them for their survivability is best for them to be. Probably it's the north coast of Africa. Pictured is one of the most powerful formations in the war at this point. Force H at the Battle of Cape Spartavento. They are the prototype of the fast carrier task group. You have this fast, powerful carrier. Arc Royal. It would have been better if they had still had Courageous and Glorious not sunk, and they could have had maybe a multi-carrier force, or maybe the Illustrious class had been built to the sensible schedule which they've been set up to be able to, not paused by Churchill, but no. No. Still, the Royal Navy's providing a very effective task group. It's got Renown, which, as mentioned earlier, is the only upgraded battlecruiser. If you'd upgraded Repulse instead of Royal Oak, you could have had both Renown and Repulse with this force, which might have made a difference in Spartavento. Because, why am I talking about that? Because in Spartavento in 1940, you have a problem afterwards. This force, which is made up of a battle cruiser, which is famed by this point for having driven off Nisenau and Scharnhorst solo, you have Shiny Chef, HMS Sheffield, the town class, which has been through so much already. You have HMS Dispatch. You have nine destroyers of the F class, you know, D class, and even some newer vessels. You have Ark Royal loaded with full Mars, with skewers, and with swordfish. A capable carrier. And yet they withdraw in the face of the Gilio Chesre with her 10 12.6 inch guns and the Vittoria Veneto with her 15, uh, 15 inch guns and their supporting vessels. And you get, honestly, Churchill turning round with, backed up by the Lord of Corkinori, trying to demand a court-martial into the conduct of Somerville. Now, for starters, Cunningham threatens to resign of it, but this is one of the problems here. You have the naval officer in charge of this critical force is a man who could have been... Well, he was very nearly Beatty's fla uh, flag lieutenant signals officer instead of the poor gentleman who did get it, and he probably wouldn't have... Somville, as a career signals officer, would not have mucked up the communications as they were ha they had, but also in the nicest way, would probably have scrubbed out Beatty's communications a bit. But we'll leave that to one side. It's unfair to make comparisons. Somville was a career signals officer who became a career electronics officer and a career radar officer who understood all this stuff, who had been brought out back from his retirement, which he'd been on from health grounds, first of all to assist with technical issues in the electronics department, then to go and help out at Dun uh, help out with the evacuation of Dunkirk, and then he sent down the Force H to do Mers el Kabir. And every time Churchill is questioning him. Does he have the stomach 
Does he have the heart? Does he have the aggr necessary aggression? Now, you can make the case he does or doesn't, but in nicest way, you can also make the case, why the f are you employing him? He was medically retired. You've had to call him back? Why? Because you've lost so many officers through, uh, through working them to death prior to the war, and even now you are have struggling to generate the senior officers. Why? Because the Royal Navy's had a problem with the last few decades. The Geeds Axe, very necessary, very, very necessary, you can argue, for supporting the Navy, for making it viable in Parliament and all those things, but it had also cut the Royal Navy off at its ankles in terms of generating senior officers. They had been used to having a certain mass to be able to draw from, to generate senior officers quickly, and they no longer had it. And then that mass was consistently under attack for the next 20 odd years. And that means you have more and more work being placed on fewer and fewer officers. And they get overworked. And you lose them. And this is the problem. The Royal Navy is not rotating in different flag officers. This is one of the great differences between the Pacific War and the war in the Mediterranean, the war in the Atlantic, is the Americans are able to rotate in these command structures to rotate them in and out in order to allow them to rest, recuperate, but also take a time and think through things. The British don't. You, you hear Cunningham so often because, honestly, there aren't many other options. It's Cunningham or Cunningham. Quite literally, it's Andrew or John. And you have Somerville, or who? You have a great crop of young officers coming up. Vian's not an option this point, he's just a captain. Yes, he'll go on to become a Commodore, a Rear Admiral, and get promoted up, but at this point, no. You're going to have to rapidly promote officers up, and that takes time. But also, every time you rapidly promote an officer up, what are you also doing? You're removing that officer from another position, and you're having to replace behind them. You don't just promote an officer up, you then have to fill in behind them and promote others up. And you don't have an inexhaustible supply of good officers, and you need to leave some experience at every level. You can't just take all your best captains and promote them to Admiral. Because that will leave you with no good captains for any Admiral to command. And then you're up the creek without a paddle. This was the big losses of Courageous and Glorious. It wasn't the ships. And honestly, in this case of Glorious, probably not even the captain. He was a probably a decent submariner, but should never have been anywhere near a carrier. But... You can not rebuild crew as quickly as you can rebuild ship numbers. And at this point, I could be saying, well, the British should be building this, that, and the other, but honestly, the British are building everything they can. Would I like them to start the 1942 flight fleet carrier program in 1941? Yes. Could they do it? Yes, they've got the plan. They've still got HMS Unicorn sitting there. Would they do it? The problem is justifying it in a European-centric war. A light fleet carrier program makes sense if you're fighting a war in the distances of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And you're having to put together ships for that. But if you don't immediately have to do that, then really you want a fleet carrier program. Why? Because the armour and the protection of a full fleet carrier versus a light fleet carrier and a survivability is better for this water, Mediterranean. For when you have a carrier group coming up against two fast enough battleships.
what we can think about this, what this fleet might have accomplished, if it had had a modernized repulse, and it had had, I don't know, glorious with it, or courageous. The options could be very interesting. Or maybe they would have been back with the home fleet, and instead the HMS Victorious would have been down with Ark Royal. There are options. Sparta Vento, though. It's given the Royal Navy a lot to think about. The problem at this point, that all the problems come down to personnel. They come down to a shortage of personnel. They come down to people at the top not quite sure how to fight the strategic reality of the, of the current war. Things which were going to be taken as standard in terms of Norway, in terms of France, have been turned on their head. We don't have France as an ally. Norway is not a neutral. It's been conquered. This is an entirely different strategic nightmare than they were foreseeing. And at the same time, you have issues in the Far East. Now, in January 1941, what could you do about that? Well, can you deploy forces? Theoretically, but justifying deploying them is going to be difficult. What you could do is make a statement. You could have a unified Far Eastern command. Unfortunately for that, you would have to deploy someone very senior. I've been over this in discussions before. There are discussions and there are points about making such a unified command going on through 1940, through from actually 1939. The officer I would send is Tritt. He has the political trust of the Australians, of New Zealanders, and of Churchill. He has the seniority of being an admiral of the fleet. He's been a, he's a member of parliament, so he's got that going for him. He's not going out there to be a fleet commander. He's going out there to be a theatre commander. And to try and organise the theatre into some sense of organisation. It would allow you to send out any land forces commander, including the one who goes out there for the army. He would be the land forces commander instead of having to be chief of staff. He would have a senior air forces commander and he would have a senior naval force commander, probably Tom Phillips. And you could set up a structure and you could start organizing things together. Now, does this magically produce you more forces and make you more secure against the Japanese? No. But if you do set up a staff, which is going to be relatively low impact in terms of personnel, because you can send out junior ones to be trained up, a few seniors to keep it going, and you do start organising it up, and he sets up headquarters, would he set it up in Singapore, would he set it up somewhere else, there is a whole debate you can have there, where he would set up, or where they would set up a command. You could start forming it with the Dutch... Bringing in, the ally, uh, bringing in the other allies who are out there and going, right then, we're going to form together an alliance for defending, uh, for defending ourselves. That would have made sense. You are having to draw down forces, so you have to make sure you get the most out of the forces you have there. The only way you're going to do that is if you have them under a, com a single authority and command. What do I see such a command structure doing in the Far East? Probably screaming and shouting for an aircraft carrier to be deployed. But leaving that to one side, more than likely they would also be pushing heavily. And I say this with a lot of love and respect. Pushing heavily for things to be, be uh, things to be more organised in terms of the command structures involved, the deployment of forces. I could see synergies being achieved. There is a tremendous amount of duplication of effort between the various disparate command structures. And you have to remember, 
there are multiple command structures involved in the Far East prior to this point. So usually one of the points that people come to is go, oh, well, you know, you didn't have the spare officers, you didn't have spare this, but you have a command structure in about five different theater commands, if you can just using sort of the level of theater command, not actually called theater commands, out in the Far East region in India and that, sort of that area. You could have made it into one theater command. You could have located it. You could have given one senior officer the overall responsibility. And there is really only one option going around at this point who would achieve that. It would have to be a naval commander because it's going to be naval forces to join it all together. And it's traditionally the naval theater. There's also the fact that, honestly, the army do not want to deploy any of their big guns out there because they want them in North Africa, fighting in North Africa, so they don't want any of their top people out there and they also want them at home. The Royal Air Force the same. The Royal Navy will probably accept for Trit or someone like that to go away because they have a few options to get a... Could as I sent is Lord Cork and Ori. Um, we can hope he wouldn't be sent. But he is another option. I personally discount him because I consider him having mucked up Norway and being next to useless. Primarily because he leads an uh, does try to lead a actual court martial into Somerville. Until Cunningham threatens to resign. Basically, Cunningham threatens to resign the Royal Navy and come back and be Somerville's advocate. His lawyer, for want of a better term, in the court martial. And then um, basically everyone decides that would not be good look. And uh, so, no. But no, the issues are personnel and command structures. And the weakness is you need a joint up command for the Far East. You, there is no easy answer to the solution of finding senior officers. There really isn't. I would love to be able to offer an easy solution for the bind the Royal Navy got themselves into. There isn't. There was an interesting paper put forward a couple of years ago, which was that if you have got to get rid of senior officers, but you want to retain the ability to call them back into service in case you need to expand command structures, you use them as professors in staff colleges. And that was a quite an interesting paper, but there were two issues with that. One, usually you're using their four officers who are retiring anyway to go into the staff colleges. And to how much are they going to earn? Are you going to have them still saying, because usually the reason you're getting rid of these officers is because someone wants to save money on the budget. If you're then transferring them on a full pay to go and teach in the staff college, that's not going to save you any money. And therefore it's not going to work. But it's a nice idea and something worth thinking about. Retention and expansion of forces is not just being able to expand the vessels and the equipment, and that's critical enough. But you also need senior NCOs, senior officers, all those things which hold a force together need to be able to expand it. The United States Navy in January 1941. Pearl Harbor is going to come up a lot as an image in this. It is, because to an extent it has to. It has to because Pearl Harbor is the linchpin and the US Navy is putting more and more emphasis on that. Is it a sensible place to be putting it? I would not be alone. I would have the backing of pretty much every Admiral, Richard, um, who commanded there, Kimmel, his predecessor, Richardson, all these ones would back me up. They're not going to move, though, because Roosevelt's not going to do that. So what do you do? Well, A, I would like to keep as many ships out of the harbour as possible. But they do that anyway. Kimmel especially does that. I have great respect for Kimmel and his efforts in that regard. So what is the option? What can you do to protect your fleets? 
Well, in January 1941, you need to start an escort program. There's funding coming in. The US Navy is getting the funding and starting to get the money. They need to start their own escort program. This is going to be... Uh, this is a problem that is going to hit them. We know that with, we know that with hindsight. But you can also tell that with foresight, because if you look at what's going on in the world at home, there are lots of issues with submarines in the Atlantic. There are lots of issues with submarine warfare going on. You need to expand your escort program. You need to start pumping out as many escorts as you can get your hands on. And they are slowly edging there, but they could be edging there faster. I'd also say I want to give more impetus to the, ex uh, to the carrier program, but there again... The various hordes of carriers are starting to spring to life in terms of ideas and orders already. So, what's your big problem? Basing. Now, you can solve this with money, but you need more money to do it. How can you secure more facilities around the world? Well, again, I would be tempted at this point to be doing a combination of things. I would certainly be looking at the Philippines and thinking that's a very strong forward base. But is that a bit close to Japan? I'm not, I don't presume Pearl Harbor is going to be attacked, according to my higher strategic thinking publicized as traditional. But the Philippines is often something I'm thinking is going to be attacked. Now... In the Spanish-American War, I'd started off my forces from Hong Kong. I was using British bases were traditional. Some of the agreements I've already assigned, uh, assigned with the British are allowing me basing rights and are going to be sort of featuring that sort of uh, those sort of agreements. I would probably be moving a large portion of my fleet in the Far East back from the Philippines to Singapore. Now, that is probably going to shock a few people, but let me explain why. So I want to defend the Philippines. But if I'm sitting in the Philippines, that's no defense of the Philippines. I don't want to be sitting too far back from the Philippines. I can't be sitting and defending the Philippines from Honolulu. But I need to be a fleeting being that can quickly surge forward to interfere with any tax. Now, that means I can move them back, but Manila has had less money spent on it than even Singapore. But if I take ships back to Singapore, especially if the British do do the combined, the combined command structure thing, I can maybe set up a joint task force with the British. Or I could set myself up there and go to the Dutch and go to the others and go, let's form an allied command structure and appoint and put one of my own officers in charge. The British might even accept that. They are, after all, desperate for senior commanders. And this is all about trying to provide that joint force structure because... One of the interesting things is, on paper, the Allies are never really that outmatched in terms of numbers and tonnage and theoretical capabilities by the Japanese. But they're often outfought by them because the Allies just can't work together and haven't got the process in place. And again, this is nothing new. You also have the fact that, let's be honest, in American industry terms, rather interestingly enough, these two things are started not that differently apart from each other, but it takes longer apparently to build Alaska than it does Missouri. Now, myself, I always said again that if the Alaskas had been started earlier, they would have been some of the most useful ships the US Navy ever acquired they would have been the perfect size to be the fast fleet es uh, fleet carrier escort. And you might well have had a scenario where the Iowas themselves got curtailed at one or two or three because the Alaskas would have just proved so good and done the job. Then no one would have thought, well, shall we build 
ca major ca fast capital ships. Or alternatively, they might have built the Alaskas and then gone, well, we'll skip the Iowas and we'll build a focus on the Montanas. Because we don't need the fast ship. The Alaska will help us fight the Congos. But the fact is that the Alaskas do ta take longer to build than the Missouri. Which also shows you something else about the Americans. Their resources are not infinite. Yes, they have a massive of resources. Yes, they put a lot into the construction. But they don't have infinite resources. They do have to marshal their resources. And they do. Well, this is the last year this will appear. Royal Navy Commonwealth. What do you do in 19, January 1941? You're expanding as quickly as you can. Every single Navy is doing this. There are humongous weaknesses involved in this. What are you expanding into? One interesting thing is about the Australian Navy is they are a cruiser Navy which is expanding into a broader Navy. The Canadian Navy is a small destroyer Navy expanding into something far bigger. But still destroyers and escorts. They don't have much in the way of anything bigger. Honestly, I think the Canadian Navy makes a mistake when they go for a six-inch cruiser. Which is... People are going to look at me and go, why? And there is a reason for that. I think... Having a six-inch cruiser is a great status tool. And I can see why the Royal Navy wants to have it. But having one or two is not useful for the Canadians. It just isn't. They need more flexibility than that. They need more capability than that. And so they either need to order more or less and order more of probably Haida and the friends. And actually the tribals do make a very good fit for the naval needs of the various Commonwealth nations. The Indian Navy is... It needs to be expanded more, it needs to be invested in more, but it's getting the Indian government to do it. And when I'm talking about the Indian government, I'm talking about the British government of India. They just... They don't understand. Why do we need Navy? We have the Royal Navy. Well, have you noticed that the Royal Navy is kind of heavily committed fighting a battle in the Atlantic? i.e. the huge campaign that is the Atlantic Theatre. Um, Arctic. Oh, and the Mediterranean. They might need some help here. And anything you can do to help is going to be greatly received. Ah, well. So... Weaknesses for all the Commonwealth navies, they, they need to expand. Basically, their weaknesses is, are infrastructure, personnel, everything. And they're pouring money into them, so there's nothing really you can change. Not in 1941. This is the reality. As the war goes on, your, result, your ability to change things reduces. The best time to change things, to set yourself up for success, is peacetime. Because the moment you're in the war, the enemy gets a far bigger say in what you do with resources and what resources you have. Because they sink stuff. In peacetime, they can scream and holler and shout, but they aren't going to be blockading you or interdicting your trade in any way. They aren't going to be sinking your ships, so you're actually going to be able to count on resources and go, well, yes, I have this many ships, because they haven't been sunk. And you're not going to suddenly find, hang on, we've lost Norway and we've lost France, so we need more ships to cover France, the Bay of Biscay, and we also need to cover 
this side of the Mediterranean. This side of the Mediterranean. We also need to cover parts of the Atlantic, which they were covering. Oh, and we need to find more ships to cover the Norway, UK, Iceland gap, and Greenland. Uh, UK, no, UK, Iceland, Greenland gap, and Norway. It's sort of because they can now get up there and get out, and they can operate from Norway. They can go and fuel. These are things which you do not expect. And the moment wartime happens, you have to go with the resources you have. You fight wars with what you have, not what you want. You fight battles with what is available, not what you wish for. And what is available literally means what is in the theatre, what is where you are fighting. Not what is available on my balance sheet. No, because if that ship's available, but it's over in the South Atlantic and you're fighting a battle in the Indian Ocean, guess what? It's not available. Because it's not going to get there in time. And that's the South Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. They are connected. Not the North Atlantic. Not the, Ant uh, not the Arctic. The South Atlantic. It's not getting there. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed.